and we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa, your host for today. And my special guest is Malins Bart Williams. Malins, welcome to the show. We're not going to waste any time. We're going to dive right in to the conversation. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Such an absolute pleasure. Malin, so what sparked this was very recently your, your famous TED Talk um, started going viral in South Africa. As I said to you when I, when I made contact with you, I saw your video um, quite a while ago and was wanting to make contact with you then, and it didn't happen, but now I thought I need to make a concerted effort and find you. <laughs> um, because this video is just was so inspirational and what can I say you speak absolute truth mm -hmm. um, I have connected when I spoke to you, I told you about the lady I connected with in the UK um, who started this organization called learn with grandma and th through her I have met so many people in Africa Mm -hmm. um, people who live in dire circumstances where they literally don't have two cents to rub together. They have to walk miles and miles and miles to get to get water, which isn't which often isn't even clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of stories that one doesn't often hear about in the media. Uh, people come to Cape Town, South Africa, and Cape Town is a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place. But mm -hmm. a lot of people in the townships lament the fact that people don't get to see what they term the real Cape Town, mm -hmm. the Cape Town that has um, forgotten people, as they refer to, them, to themselves sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. How do we change this? Um, and I, I love the idea, and I want you to talk a little bit about your concept or your, um, your charity as opposed to charity. Mm -hmm. Because that is what we seem to be hung up on, is charity, charity, more charity. And mm -hmm. why is it not working? Because we've had, I mean, there's so many huge charities. Why is it not taking Africa out of the poverty that it is in? Mm -hmm. um, and how, how do we change? So tell me a little bit about your, cha your charity as opposed to charity. I think we have to differentiate the case of South Africa is a case that we have to look at in a very isolated manner because South Africa is the place besides Palestine where the most recent atrocities in terms of um, crimes against humanities have happened during the system of apartheid. And um, so in the case of South Africa, I think we should commence the dialogue somewhere in um, and whilst I believe the, the concept of charity is a humanitarian concept whereby um, we share, you know, um, I feel in the case of South Africa, there are different underlying issues that need to be addressed. Um, and once they're addressed, I don't know how relevant the concept of charity or how needed the concept of charity still is in South Africa. You recently had the discussion of ownership and land ownership and land being returned to the full owners. And um, I think in South Africa, there are so many discussions that are more pressing that need to be had in an honest, straightforward manner. You asked how can we change the perception? We can change the perception by being brutal. It's not always pleasurable. It's not always finely palatable, but that's the only way in which we can change the perception. And whilst you said, okay, um, they're forgotten people, people that are hardly ever seen. I dare to disagree because in my opinion that's really what um charity porn as i coin it propagates around the world we do see these starving children we do see children that have to walk for miles to get to the nearest school um we do see all of that in the media 
and yes, Cape Town also attracts tourism and um, there's another side that's being um, propagated in order to attract tourists. But we do generally have that stereotypical image of Africa because it's widely propagated through the media, starving children and so on. Um, I personally, I don't see a benefit to me. Propagating an image is not propagating a solution. Even if we show that side of Africa, it doesn't provide any solutions. It's a harsh reality that a lot of people face, yet it doesn't come with a solution. Seeing it will just trigger people into um, the behavior that, that Europeans or the Western world has displayed since years and years and years, you know, giving handouts while taking treasures and um, that's so far from the solution, in my opinion, as anything could be. How does one then change that narrative? How do we move from the poverty mentality um, that we're currently under? Because um, that was the one thing that I took from your from your video mm -hmm. um, that we seem to we as Africans seem to portray ourselves as begging to the West. Um, um, how do we how do we change that? What is it that we need to do to change that narrative? African educational systems need to be implemented. It's impossible with an oppressor and an oppressor's narrative that fails to tell the truth and sugar sugarcoats a narrative that serves the ongoing exploitation, that serves the um, the systems that have been established and that continue to to function today um, based on a lot of lies that we have been told. You know, the history books are so far from the, the truth as Hollywood's most um, fantastic movies and um, I feel as Africans we should um, we should not waste time with being indoctrinated with a um, European doctrine whether that's educational academic doctrines whether that's religious doctrines I feel identity is what truly makes you wealthy um, identity is what prevents you from going astray. Identity is what prevents you from being exploited, from being robbed of who you truly are, because it all begins with that. When Africans were robbed of their identity, their image of who they truly were, and made to believe that they are less than humans, um, they came to accept a certain treatment. Obviously, it was also um, forced upon them with terror, with weapons, with violence. But at one point, they were broken into submission because they truly believed that that was their place in society. And so I believe it starts there. It starts rejection, rejecting existing um, doctrines. And I follow um, what's going on in South African schools. More and more young students are rebelling against the existing systems. Afrikaans has been dropped as the official language at which university was it? Pretoria or I can't remember which uh, university. Pretoria. That, yeah. So these are great micro steps in the right direction because you can't, number one, I feel the language lacks the vocabulary and the intellectual scope to really convey topics that are taught in university because it's a very primitive dialect, you know, as a German speaking native speaker, uh, I understand the root of the language and it's as primitive as it gets. So number one, it is not, it lacks the standard to convey certain topics. It can be, the history that that language holds should be rejected to begin with. And um, so that's a step in the right direction, you know, but ultimately the entire educational system across Africa 
has to change in the places where where the narrative of the colonizer to this day colonizes the mind with their perception and perspectives. You know, as Africans, we hold such vast traditions, um, historic greatness, you know, that we're not being taught in schools or we are not teaching in schools. I, I want to refrain from using a passive term that we are not teaching in schools because we can't wait for anybody to teach us what is ours. And um, we learn like hours and hours, two thirds of the curriculum is pretty much Western history. Even though Western history, Western contribution to world history is oppression, colonialism, slavery, and that is pretty much it. And then we have some great inventors like Einstein, Tesla, and so on that also come forth, you know, from that same culture. But what continuously makes up this culture is oppression, genocide, you know, across the globe. There's literally out of the world's probably 90 percent of the countries have been colonized you know by Europeans so it's pretty much their narrative so why should we as Africans learn about that where we have so much greatness to tell I mean we learn about the Great Wall of China instead we should learn about the Ia of Benin which is to this date the greatest man-made archaeological structure you know and um greater than the pyramids of Giza, we should learn about Dandera, about um, Abydos, about the greatness of these civilizations, about Sudan, about, you know, like we need to reassume and own our narrative. I think that's where it all begins. And then the rest is a natural byproduct because you aspire to what you came from. And if your narrative starts and ends with slavery, with apartheid, with oppression, then you're always then that's your benchmark, you know, but instead I believe we should understand what truly makes us and remember that and aspire to that. Balance, another question I have for you is, you know, we all look at, at poverty. Poverty is all around us. Mm -hmm. You, did you grow up in Sierra Leone or in Germany? Germany for the in greater Germany. part of my life, yeah. Okay, so if you grew up in Germany, what is it that prompted you to want to do something? Because we all see poverty around us, um, but it doesn't mean that we take the necessary steps to be the change. What mm. is it that drove you to want to be the change? My mother is German, white, German. My father is Syrian, black African. Um, and I'm a mix of these, not just these cultures, but also their true nature. And I would say it helps me greatly to understand the European mindset as well as the African mindset. And the greatest dilemma between my parents was that my father would literally give everything away go overboard, giving everything to his mm -hmm. family, extended family and my mother was continuously frustrated with this trait of him, you know, because for her it was, this is for me, this is for my family, for our family. And I saw that even when kids would visit after school, you know, and I saw that other German families after school, it's not the same mentality. At an African household, you come there, and if they have one loaf of bread, they will share it and make sure that you eat first as the guest, you know? At a German household, it's like, it's time to eat now, you should go home, you know? <laughs> you should go home. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and my mother is not a bad person. She's a lovely lady, she's remarkable. But that was so inertly German, you know? This is seven yogurts, we bought them because we have seven <laughs> people that will eat here and you must go home now, you know? I'm exaggerating, but it's, it's, I house both of these characteristics in me. I'm grateful to have this balance because yes, um, 
Africans have the tendency to share everything constantly, continuously. It's beautiful, but it will also prevent you from accumulating what might be necessary in order to successfully run a family because the family mm -hmm. is an operation. So when you ask me what prompted me to give, I come very giving, very generous. Um, I love to give. I love to open my homes. I had to learn the hard way that this is not always the right thing to do, you know, and I'm often too trusting and I've been disappointed many times by people I considered close friends um, that have abused that. Certainly that would not have happened to my German mom because <laughs> this is like, who are you? What are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, when you ask the prompt, that it's it's what makes me what makes my character and what still prompts me today you know after learning my lessons and learning to put myself first at all times and then give because for me it was giving first and second and third and maybe tenth was about me you know and um that's why I'm, I'm, yeah, I can laugh about it now. And, um, but it also helps me to understand a lot of things, you know, and Africans, they, they tend to not claim ownership because they're so blessed. Basically the garden of Eden is Africa. Everything grows. Everything is produced by the soil. It's, it's, it's so lavish beyond lavish you know so basically if you have today you know you have tomorrow kind of and what we perceive as, as as poverty and so on still holds so much wealth it holds so much laughter it holds so much joy it holds so much music it holds so much shine it holds so much creativity art culture you know it's um yes it's it's not having a bank account it's not having a house you know that's built of brick maybe but it has so much wealth that's almost non-quantifiable and if you have everything that's also human nature you tend to not not to hoard you know and mm -hmm. i have that in me i have a skill set that could certainly make me a very wealthy person if I had a stronger drive to be that, you know, I have the education, I have the contacts, I have the network, I really have all the components, you know, and somebody else would utilize that entirely differently. But for me, the way I eat is always to give. That's where my concept of charity comes in because that's what drives me. That was what pleasures my heart, you know, and it's I, difficult to explain that to someone when you get such complete joy out of giving and I, I heard what you were saying you know people can take advantage of that it does happen to most of us and it can it it can change you if you allow it to but if you are a really good kind-hearted person within your soul um, nothing can change that you really just need to change your perspective as it is um, and and not allow and, and not allow to get it allow it to get you down and change who you are at heart um, and stop being giving, but just keep it in perspective. Um, it did because change you lose me. perspective. Yeah. It did change me and it had to change me because what happened to me repetitively, um, I feel when you encounter repetition in life and circumstances, you should look at yourself, you know, and um not at others and say oh this is so unfair you have to always realize and understand the environment you live in we're not living in an ideal world and it did change me and i'm glad it changed me you know because certain things do not happen to me anymore and i'm also glad i have that german where i if i really have to and must i can draw boundaries and mm, so I have the privilege of really seeing both sides and understanding where it comes from. I also understand that extremes result in extreme situations. And um, 
with my work, I try to be a bridge. I try to facilitate understanding. That's often when we look at a global picture and when we see what is still going on to this day, the exploitation, the oppression in the United States against black people, an ongoing genocide that we witness live, you know, where innocent people are being murdered by the very system that's supposed to protect them. No consequences for police officers murdering innocent people. Um, so I understand very much the frustration of like the mistrust of black people that did not have, like me, my white parent, my mother was the same woman that would also defend me when I was being discriminated against in Germany growing up and so on. So I have that, but I understand a black person that does not have such a close interaction with a white person, mm -hmm. built such a strong trust level like I have with my mother, will not be able to trust a white person. It's just sheer impossible because of what we see every day. Why would they trust them? You know, when these are the very people like being after their lives. You know, just for existing, just for being black, just for whilst exploiting their culture. And I mean, what would be American culture without black culture? What would the Grammys be without black people there? It would be a, a pretty petty funeral, pretty much, you know? So I, I can really put myself into both. I can see it from first you know, and um, I, I lost track of what your question really was, but um, <laughs> <laughs> now you said I shouldn't let it change me. I am glad it changed me. And I would love for African people to change because in order for what is happening to stop from happening, black people, African people must change because if you open your home, your country, to everyone that is not of your nature. What is happening today will continue to happen. That's also human nature. You don't see a fence, you'll trespass naturally. I do that. Oh, there's an apple tree. Oh, there's a beautiful lawn. Let me lay down. You know, without even thinking this lawn belongs to some farmer or someone. You know, and Africans don't do that because historically everybody knows where the boundaries were. This belonged to so and so, and since her there or grandfather great great grandfather it's not so much rich agreements you know an african believes a word is a bond you know and for a white person it is a piece of you know and so it's i understand what you're trying to say no you can't let your heart be corrupt but you we do it with software, we do it with hardware, we constantly upgrade, you know, that is evolution. And Africans, what is happening will continue to happen as long as we're like, ooh, this fairy tale, open arms, and yes, everybody is welcome. No. Yeah, it's all, it's all about finding the perfect balance. And I, I understand where you're coming from um, in terms of saying we do need change. Um, what I was trying to say is it didn't close your heart to helping people. Yes, you needed no. to make a shift in the way that you were doing mm -hmm. things, but it didn't yeah. close you off to say, well, that's it. I've been taken advantage of too many times and I'm stopping the bus. I am no, my door is no longer open. That's that's what I meant it in terms of it. It did for a moment. Yeah. It did for a moment. It must, <laughs> like just gradually getting back on track with it. So, so the other thing I want to ask you about lastly is um, something I've been giving a lot of thought since I watched your, your TED talk is smartphones. It's yes. something that every, it's in the hands of millions, billions of people. Um, and those who don't have it want it. But yes. it's built on the back of poor people. Yes. Um, where children are exploited, and I did, I did note in in one of your interviews that you were looking at 
um, establishing a company that would build these smartphones um, mm -hmm. and not exploit children yes. in the process. That's my can you very talk, dear Can to you talk heart. a little bit about that? Yes. I, I, I did see today in the news actually that there's a company in in Rwanda that is opening up a factory um, that will build smartphones in in Africa and and when I when I saw that article the first thing that went through my mind was I hope that they are not also going to be exploiting these children in Sierra Leone that was the first thought that went through my mind and I don't know um, I actually whoever tweeted that article I, I that was my tweet back to them saying I hope that this means the end of exploitation <laughs> mm, can you talk a little bit about that phones, it is not that simple because a lot of people think oh let's let's just build the smartphone somewhere else that's not the point the smartphone what really is the crucial component and it's because I've been dedicating uh, personal resources, time, energy to this for the past two years now um, because I want to make it happen and um, build the world's first ethical phone with ethical minerals. Um, it's the components that are the key and are being built by a handful of companies, most of which really do not really care about the capacitor, the raw materials for the capacitors being sourced ethically. And Sierra Leone, the problem is not so prevalent in Sierra Leone where it is really a huge problem in the Congo. I mean, this is modern day slavery where children are slaved to death and then turned over, flipped over. And the Congo has quite a few of these conflict minerals and um, others besides coltan. So basically it's not just building a phone and getting the components again from China, the motherboard, because there's a few companies that make the motherboards, right? So yes, there are smartphone companies that are popping up that are building phones in Africa, but they're not building their own motherboard. So my research has gone into how can I build an ethical motherboard? How can I build an ethical tantalite capacitor? These are these tiny, tiny things that we see are on the motherboards, these conductors. And that is, yeah, that's what I'm working on. The phone afterwards, that's almost like, yeah, it's child's play, you know, to put that together. But the minerals, how do we source these minerals? How much value do we to these minerals? Apple does not know their their coltan comes from. You know, so it's not just building the phone; it's building a supply chain transparency. It's it's working with reliable and that you can only do that if you're the manufacturer of the phone. Set certain profit margin aside to pay a premium and translate that to the consumer who's also willing to pay a premium. They know they're holding an ethical phone where an adult person got a fair wage to mine that, you know, and not a five-year-old, six-year-old, 12-year-old child in the rain that's depraved from getting an education. No, it should be the opposite and should be everyone's responsibility because we rely on these devices every day. They bring so much benefit, so much comfort to us that we, I, as my lens, I feel I cannot leave this earth with a clear conscience as long as I haven't solved this problem because I'm using it every day. I can make other alternatives vegan. I can opt for non leather goods. I can opt for healthier and more cruelty-free alternatives. But when it comes to my electronics, I so guilt that I just felt okay an alternative a healthy alternative is not the solution just 
why is it that you think uh, manufacturers like you know Apple, for example, I'm not singling them out per se, but why surely they must be aware um, of the manufacturing process? Why are they not doing anything um, about it or are they just turning a blind eye? And I'm not sure. saying just Apple, there's other manufacturers as well. Are they just turning a blind eye to the process? Uh, two reasons. I truly believe uh, a lot of Europeans lack compassion because when we watch what historically has happened using human resource as a commodity, which is also happening today, and Europeans have demonstrated that trade over several hundred years consecutively, then I feel it's fair to say as a people, as a culture, they lack compassion. Second reason, and I call everybody a European that came from Europe just because they hold a, a South African passport, an American passport, an Australian passport to me, I classify them as Europeans. So Apple being a European company, I believe they lack compassion. Um, secondly, they lack insight for a non-African, for a European person to really understand the dynamics in Africa is extremely difficult, close to impossible. So for Apple now to buy their Colton, um, that's where they feel their responsibility ends. And, um, in all honesty, as a business, it does end there. It's not Apple's responsibility if we're just talking strictly business and leave the human compassion and the humanitarian side aside. If not, it's not Apple's responsibility to make sure that the call time is mined ethically. Yeah, it's the mind's responsibility. The person that sells it on the secondary market. It's their responsibility to make sure that that is happening. And that's also why I took it so close to my heart. I spent month and month and month in the mines to understand the dynamics. But I don't see an American, a European person going in there, being allowed the same access, the same insight, because they don't speak the language, they don't understand the cultural codex, you know? So with all of these insights that I gained, I feel, okay, I, I, I now understand which variables have to be monitored, you know, can be, can be adapted and modified in order to ensure that an ethical product, you know, and I feel it's almost like holding an, a miner responsible for the It's like easily far-fetched. Uh, an Apple executive, he'll hire organizations and this and that, but for him, it's like, you know, it's like Chinese. It's like you going into China and I'm expecting you to, to understand certain dynamics there. You know, it's very far-fetched. I don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I hear you. Okay. Is there any way that we as consumers could um, manipulate, for want of a better word, this change? Yes. Um, could 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 we could we as cons I mean as consumers, if we stop buying products, and I know it's a very very difficult thing. <laughs> We don't have an alternative to a smartphone, as you exactly. said, an, an ethical alternative. But exactly. Is there a way that we could put more pressure on manufacturers to do the right thing, to for mines to do the right thing? Um, you know, with, with anything else, if there's a massive outcry, we force change. Um, why is it that we cannot force change with smartphones? or the, the production of smartphones? Because the consumer's power is, a, is his or her dollar. So me giving my dollar to you, I empower you. My dollar to your neighbor, I empower the neighbor, yeah? 
me withholding my dollar means empowering no one. Yes, I can say, okay, I live without a phone, write letters, yeah, and um, live without a laptop, write letters, and I don't empower either one, neither you nor your neighbor. But 99% of all the other people will not do that, you know. They will not withdraw themselves from so society, social media, everything that, that, that is worked through the... I'm working so hard to make this happen. Is the market no brainer? The power. If we think as consumers we don't have power, then that's nonsense. Look at the 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 organic food market. You know, every supermarket has a section now: organic, non-GMO, this and that. It's because the consumer demanded and took their dollars to initially small organic grocery stores farmers market mom and pop stores then we saw whole foods we saw we saw it everywhere you know and when you in germany now in 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 in, in areas where you have low income um where you have low income family living there even these supermarkets have an organic section yeah so you really see it's not even a classist anymore and um that's entirely consumer powers. And you see companies, conglomerates like McDonald's, where we thought they're so omnipotent. This is like the fast food chain, you know? We see them struggling with bankruptcy, barely surviving, you know, and adapting their own science, their own menus, their own philosophy in order to cater to consumer demand. With the phones, the same thing. However, presently, as much as these companies want to, they lack the understanding of how to fully go about it and supply ethical minerals. And that's why um, I'm still in the process. Initially, I just thought, oh, I'm going to build my own phone and I'm going to take the coltan and put it in the phone. No, I need to build my own capacitor. I need to build my own capacitor. And as long as you don't build your own capacitors, it's all blah, blah. We have companies like Fairphone and this and that. It's a name. It's a name. It's nothing but a name, you know. But we need to change the ingredients inside in order for this to phone to be ethical. In the same manner that we change the ingredients in a meal in order for a meal to be organic, you know, ethically sourced. So it's the same thing. Melanz, apart, for, apart from your own efforts to bring about change, do you know of any other company that's doing R&D into um, these capacitors? I've been in touch with a company in Florida, Kemet Electronics. Thus far, we've not gotten very far with our exchange. The interest is there. Um, they've invested in their own... Um, tantalite mine which is a good start I'm not saying that they don't buy tantalite for the capacitors in the aftermarket or how exactly the ins and outs work um but in all honesty i've done a year-long research and i came to one place in europe that are making steps in the right direction two and you know how many capacitor motherboard manufacturers exist in this world. And two, they're scratching the surface of a solution. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Something needs to change. Yeah. That is scary. I mean, there's just about everything. All electronics are driven by a motherboard and um, and needs these capacitors. So, yeah. Um, it will truly be something revolutionary if we can find, as you said, an, an ethical product, ethical um, that will drive eth ethical mining, so we no longer exploit people and children. Yeah. Um, we don't have to find it; it's there. We know where it is. I know where the coltan is in Sierra Leone. I know where it is in the Congo. We know where it is. It's not like whoa, we're going on a treasure hunt. Let's find it's, it. It's 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 you know? it's how it's how we mine it, which yeah. is that is the problem. What we need to find is the conscience in our minds and hearts. That's what we need to find, you know, and become radically, radically 
uncompromisingly ethical about that. So, so you, I'm, I'm just dumbstruck by how, I mean, when I saw the level of exploitation, I was just simply dumbfounded, you know, and how did, how, who allows that? I mean, who permits the exploitation? Is it the, the, the government in Sierra Leone or is it the, is it the miners, as you said? Uh, in Sierra Leone, we don't have a problem with coltan. You know, the coltan you get out of Sierra Leone is probably among the most ethically mined you can find because it's like from what I've seen, it's not mined under excruciating, horrible conditions. The problem is in the Congo. The problem is in the Congo. That's where we have such a vast amount of child labor. Um, that's where we have a con uh, a, a country. It's almost bigger than a country, you know, because the Congo, the kingdom of Congo, what it originally was, you know, it stretched into Angola and so on. Um, we have a region that's systematically being destabilized because of the wealth it holds. And um, that goes beyond their own government, you know, and it was interesting to see the, friend, um, the Italian deputy prime minister attack Macron for upholding these post-colonial structures, you know, in countries that they colonized. And um, it goes beyond the local governments. You know, the local governments, a lot of presidents in Africa, it's sad to say, but they're mere puppets. And if they don't dance according to the tune of the puppet master, they eliminated, you know, we've seen it. Patrice Lumumba, wow, you know. And um, the Congo had excellent leadership for a brief moment. So, um, so, so just for everyone listening there, the problem really is not in Sierra Leone, it is in Congo where there is a, a problem with unethical mining and that's where the change needs to be. Correct. I think the change needs to be in France. <laughs> yes. And the French economy. I think the French should stop having two, three month holidays and generate a, re a little bit more real GDP. Yeah. A great part of the economy and former French colonies, you know, and um, I think that's where the change needs to happen. You know, you can't expect to be a first world country based on croissant and on, I don't know, Chanel, you know, that doesn't justify, and on Renault, that doesn't justify you being in the ranks of so-called first world countries economically. You know, I think that's where the change needs to happen. They need to amp up their GDP independently and leave African countries to be. Malens, I want to say thank you so much for spending this time with me. Um, I think, you know, we we must never stop telling stories mm -hmm. um, because through st storytelling, we share with the world um, what is really happening on the ground because unless we tell the stories, people in the rest of the world will never know about um, our challenges that we face, hmm. and um, and so I'm I'm glad that we we could have this conversation, mm -hmm. and I want to share this um, in in my network. And and if you are watching this um, interview on the replay, please do share. We want we want people to know that um, we want to promote ethical electronics. Yes, and. Um, if we want to promote ethical electronics, we mustn't allow this conversation to die. We need to have the conversation, um, keep it foremost in our minds, um, talk about it, and find ways to drive change. Um, Correct. Just as you said, with organic, with organic um, foods now, the change came about because people drove the change. Mm -hmm. And so likewise, when it comes to ethical electronics, we can be the change by talking about it um, because and if we talk about it, no one's going to, right. 
There we go. Valens, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the time chatting to you. Um, to you. our to our pleasure. To our viewers, thank you so, so much for spending the time with us and watching the conversation live with Malin Bart Williams. Thank you, everyone. If you're watching this on the replay, please do go and share it. So from me, Brigitte Limbanda in Cape Town in South Africa, I want to say thank you and goodbye for now. Take care. Bye-bye.